I want to tell you today about something absolutely miraculous that happened right in this room several years ago. My friend Jamie, a beloved member of our community, a mother of four beautiful little children, was suffering from agonizing, inexplicable abdominal pain. For months, she tried to ignore the pain, but every day it grew worse until one Shabbat, standing right in the back of this room, Jamie turned to her friend, Ellen, a deeply empathic soul, and Jamie shared what was going on. Ellen was concerned. She sensed that this was serious. She urged Jamie to see a doctor immediately. She gave her the name and number of her gastroenterologist, and over the next few days, she followed up with texts and calls in order to make sure that Jamie made the appointment. Ellen's insistence shook her. Jamie finally dragged herself to the doctor, who took one look at her and ordered a full body scan. Within hours, the call came. Get to the emergency room now. Tests had revealed that while the pain was issued from the abdomen, the real problem was a tumor that was wrapped around her spine. They rushed Jamie into surgery where to extract the tumor, they had to remove a nerve root, which could have left her experiencing pockets of numbness in her body for the rest of her life. But Jamie remembers the surgeon saying to her, we'd rather take that risk than leave the tumor there where it will lead to total paralysis. The tumor was the size of a grapefruit. Jamie is astonished by this detail. Imagine you have something that big attacking your system, she said, and you don't even really know it's there or fully understand the nature of it until it almost breaks you. Through a combination of the doctor's ingenuity and God's grace and Jamie's iron will, she survived. And that abdominal pain, it saved her life. It was the pain that awakened her to the existence of the tumor that could have, God forbid, killed her. I have returned to this story again and again during the tumultuous past many years, not only because Jamie is a medical miracle, and I thank God that she is still with us, but also because of the grace that landed her with a clinician who was willing to take a clear-eyed look at the patient before her in order to discern the right diagnosis. And now, today, this story is once again at the forefront of my heart and mind as we enter into a difficult conversation about the state of Israel. These are the first High Holy Days since the election last January of the most extreme right-wing government in Israel's history. This is a regime that boasts a brand of Jewish supremacy that is anathema to our post-enlightenment self-understanding and profoundly threatening to Israel's democracy. This Yom Kippur is also 50 years to the day from the start of the Yom Kippur War, when simultaneous surprise attacks posed an existential threat to the young state of Israel. Today, Israel's intelligence and security apparatus and the Israeli street are sounding a different alarm. The existential threat to the state of Israel is internal. The call is coming from inside the house. To put it plainly, a few days ago, an Israeli elder stood in front of the Knesset holding a protest sign that read, the scariest moment of my life was facing the Syrian tank brigade in 73, plowing through our northern border in the Golan Heights. Until today. What is happening today with this government is even scarier. For the past 40 some weeks, Israelis of all ages, backgrounds, socioeconomics have risen up in protest. This is the largest social protest movement in Israel's history, far surpassing our own protest movements in the United States. A creative, courageous, consistent, pres consistent presence, roughly the equivalent to 17 million Americans protesting on the streets week after week after week. There is no question that this is a moment of great collective awakening in the Israeli consciousness. And what about us, American Jews? 
How are we to respond to the cataclysmic eruption in Israel, to the messaging from Israeli family and friends, we need you, we need your help? What is demanded of us in this time of moral crisis for the Jewish people? In this season, we open our hearts to the work of tshuva, reckoning and reconciliation rooted in the deeply held promise that change and repair are possible. It's the Slonim Rebbe, a great 20th century Hasidic teacher who offers a simple metaphor that I find myself returning to, comparing the work of spiritual and emotional healing to the work of healing from physical illness. One must take care, he writes, before prescribing a cure in order to properly identify the nature of the illness. Some illnesses require nothing more than a few days of rest. Others require serious, invasive treatments and some life-threatening surgeries. This metaphor works on so many levels. As patients, naturally, we dread a bad diagnosis, but we also accept that, as Jamie's story attests, healing is, not, is, healing is only possible if our ailments are properly diagnosed. Telling the truth very simply is essential to healing. We must tell the truth about what is happening, where we are, and how we got here. I'm speaking right now especially to those among us who, like me, see in Israel a miraculous national renaissance. Who, we who celebrate the astonishing revival of the Hebrew language, who take great pride, not only in the safe haven, but also in the startup nation, the flourishing of Jewish art and ideas and culture, the rebirth of academies of Torah learning, the bounty and the promise, the beauty and the bravery, even or especially in the face of grave threats, the realization of the Jewish National Liberation Project. It is especially we who must be honest about the ailment that is now endangering the collective body. We must remember that minimizing or downplaying the illness does not help the patient. In fact, it could be fatal. Those most invested in the health and the vitality of this patient need to invest in a fair and accurate diagnosis, even when it hurts to speak or to hear the truth. The emergence of this government, its relentless attacks on Jewish and democratic norms, the ruptures that it has created in Israeli society and throughout the Jewish world, all of this points to symptoms that are screaming to be diagnosed if there is to be a chance of effective treatment. To do the work of tshuva, it is imperative that we move beyond the platitudinous, the protests are a reflection of Israel's robust democracy. The primary driver of the protest movement on the street has been a rift over the nature of judicial power, but that is not the essence of the ailment. The threat facing Israel today was not born when the prime minister last year fighting first and foremost to keep himself out of prison, signed a deal with the devil, bringing the most extreme actors into positions of power, including one person who was barred from compulsory service in the IDF after being convicted of supporting a terror organization and inciting racism. No, there is a much deeper illness that is afflicting this body, which we as a Jewish community must finally be willing to accurately diagnose if there will ever be an effective intervention. All diagnosticians must take a serious effort to set aside our cognitive biases and see what is truly before us, rather than what our implicit bias orients us toward. But when we do, only then do we see that this government and its maximalist agenda are the natural outcomes of a growing extremism in Israeli society, manifesting most egregiously in more than a half century of occupation. 56 years of too many people allowing our own trauma and fear to justify the denial of basic rights 
dignities, and dreams for millions of Palestinian people living under Israeli rule. Decades of justifying an unjustifiable status quo as the only reasonable response to the failures and missteps of Palestinian leadership and the violence of Palestinian extremists. Many of us have spent years trying not to look. We don't know because we don't want to know, because the world is sometimes cruel and unfair to Jews, and yes, delivers to Israel disproportionate opprobrium among all the bad state actors. We don't want to know because we don't want to fuel anti-Semitism, because accepting the reality of Palestinian suffering under Israeli rule means accepting that the Jewish people can be not only victims, but also victimizers. It means that our great dream, this monumental national project has come at the expense of another people's aspirations, their safety, their dignity, even their lives. But there, hidden in plain sight, is the toll of decades of occupation, the reality of life under dual systems of justice that renders Palestinians vulnerable to the whims of Israeli laws and Israeli forces with no legal recourse when terrible things happen. There stands Adel Abu Badawiya. A terrible tragedy struck Adel's family when the Israeli army years ago forcefully entered their home in Jenin. Adele's little brother, Majed, was five years old. Terrified of the soldiers, he, like all the other children, ran away. The last time his family saw him, little Majed was standing just there by the door. But when the soldiers finally left, the family could not find their little boy. They searched for hours until they discovered Majed's body in a refrigerator. In his terror, he had hidden there to escape the soldiers, and he could not get out. He died there. No mercy, no accountability. But if we're honest, it's not only they, the Palestinians, who suffer from this ailment. In April, I watched the Yom HaZikaron Memorial Day ceremony put together by Parents Circle and Combatants for Peace, and I wept when I heard Adele share this story of his little brother. And then he was joined on stage by a parade of broken-hearted Palestinians and Israelis sharing the depths of their sorrow, Yuval Sapir spoke, a professor at Tel Aviv University. His beloved sister, Tamar, had just gotten married in 1994 when a 26-year-old Palestinian man blew up the bus that she was riding in downtown Tel Aviv. She is gone, he said. And since she left, a black hole has opened up beside me like the center of the galaxy that swallows up all the light and leaves only darkness and abyss. My whole world collapsed in one fell swoop. Anat Marnin spoke. She was just a teenager when her two big brothers, Pinka and Yair Marnin, were killed in the Yom Kippur War. I was 16 years old, she said, when my world fell apart. I cannot describe the depth of the wound. My family broke. But even as Adele and Yuval and Anat spoke about their grief and their broken hearts, right-wing hecklers were shouting into bullhorns, blasting music and honking horns right outside the venue of the ceremony, anything to block out the words of these speakers. Think about it for a moment. An Israeli Jew stands up in Tel Aviv to share the story of her beloved brothers who died protecting the state of Israel and her voice is drowned out by Israeli protesters who find the notion of shared grief so threatening that they will do anything they can to prevent the rest of us from hearing her. And so we see that it's not only Adele and his little brother who were imprisoned by this reality. Yuval and his beautiful sister Anat and her big brothers, they too are locked in this prison. Palestinians and Jews alike, those who have lost the most, they must stay silent, out of sight and out of mind for the machinery of injustice to keep churning. Listen, the righteous call of this protest movement is democracy, and that we absolutely must support. But the careful diagnosis 
connects the dots between symptoms and root causes. And the fact is there can be no democracy with occupation. A society that fails. A society that fails to honor the image of God among some will ultimately undermine God's image in all. This government's radical legislative agenda has landed the body on the examination table, and it would be a travesty to diagnose a life-threatening spinal tumor as indigestion. The proposed judicial overhaul may be the abdominal pain, but the occupation, the many decades of unjust policy and practice is the grapefruit-sized tumor wrapped around the spine of the nation. And the cancer cells coursing through the body, that is homebred ideological extremism. Consider the Jewish terrorists who burned down part of the Palestinian town of Huara a few months ago, stopping only to Davin Mariv to pray the evening service, an act so heinous that it was called a pogrom by top Israeli generals who fully understand what that word evokes among Jews. What is becoming increasingly clear is that those responsible for the spike of violence in the West Bank are not lone wolf actors but they represent instead a widespread entrenched movement that is now acting from within the government itself. A movement so dangerous that one former head of the Mossad now compares them to Klansmen in the United States. How deep are we willing to go? You may remember after Charlottesville when a civil rights leader, a friend of mine named Eric Ward lifted the white hood off of the resurgent white nationalist movement, helping us all understand the centrality of anti-Semitism in white nationalism. This dangerous movement to remake America as a white-only Judenrein haven for supremacists. Through Eric's research, we began to understand just how dangerous those chants of Jews will not replace us really were. That was one year before the Shabbat morning massacre at Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh when 11 Jews were murdered as they prayed by a person intoxicated by that very ideology. Today, Israeli human rights advocates are similarly working to lift the veil and sound the alarm on the nature of zealotry that is endangering the Jewish state. It is imperative that we hear them. Yair Nehorai is one of those voices. He's a human rights attorney he grew up in the religious Zionist movement. Now, Horai has closely analyzed the doctrine of the extremist rabbis who form the ideological backbone of the movement, especially those who preach and teach in state-funded pre-military academies. He argues that their thinking, once the stuff of the extreme margins, is increasingly mainstream and, in fact, undergirds the ideology of the primary legislative leadership in Israel today. Theirs is a fight to advance a radical messianic vision that, if successful, will result in a fascist theocracy. Nehorai warns that the danger of this revolution is not that Israel turns into Poland or Hungary, but into Iran. Adherents to this movement believe that the messianic age is upon us. Their objective is a Jewish state that is ruled by rabbis with criminal sanctions against anyone who fails to observe Torah and mitzvot. The movement is proudly racist, believing that Jewish people are innately superior to all other races. They believe that they have a biblical responsibility to conquer Eretz Yisrael Hashlema, a maximalist, ahistoric conception of what's known as greater Israel and to wipe out anyone who stands in their way because the land was promised to them by God. They see any Israeli leader who gives up territory as a traitor who should be executed. In this messianic fever dream, women must be fully subjugated to men, forced into traditional gender roles that essentially eliminate us from public life in order to protect 
us and them against our innate inclination toward prostitution and promiscuity. Any public LGBTQ expression which they see, of course, as a perversion and a disgrace must be outlawed. Gentiles must be treated as second-class citizens and all expressions of Western culture like literature and the arts must be wiped clean, including democracy itself. For democratic principles they claim are fundamentally antithetical to Jewish values. Why am I talking about this? In the middle of the holiest day of the year when the most Jews are showing up in shul to listen of the entire year? Because this is not the view of one or two or 10 radical actors. This is the collective voice and the vision of the leadership of the movement that stepped into power in Israel in December, 2022. Theirs is a comprehensive messianic program cultivated over decades that has moved in the past nine months from a fringe movement in the illegal outpost equivalent of the dark corner of the internet right into the halls of power in the Knesset in Jerusalem. It's important for us, I think, to take a step back for a moment and to acknowledge that the messianic idea is actually deeply rooted in our Jewish tradition. Some of you know the legend of the haunting melody of Ani Ma'amin. Ani Ma'amin, Ani Ma'amin, Ani Ma'amin. That song was sung by many Jews as they marched to the gas chambers. It's said that the melody was written by a Jew in a cattle car on his way to Treblinka. A fellow prisoner leapt off the moving train and miraculously survived and shared this tune widely. The melody is transfixing, but the words, the words are drawn right from Maimonides' 13 principles of faith. And they're not accidental and they're not incidental. Anim Amin, I believe with complete faith in the coming of the Messiah, even though he may tarry, nevertheless, I yearn every day for his coming. In the context of Nazi genocide, Jewish messianism is not only logical, it's beautiful. It's the very embodiment of hope in hopeless times. This version of messianism paired an age-old Jewish yearning for a world perfected with the pain and the trauma of Jewish existence. The messianic dream gave spiritual strength to our people not only during the Holocaust, but for generations before, through the darkest chapters, the worst things got in Jewish history, the more feverish those messianic yearnings grew. But even as messianism has been part of our tradition for thousands of years, after the failure of the Bar Kokhba revolt in 132 CE, the messianic idea for Jews largely became a passive aspiration, the stuff of song and prayers, not swords, and guns until now. The marriage of messianic fervor to state power is a recipe for extreme violence, abuse of power, and ultimately, I am afraid, self-annihilation. It gives me no joy to share this with you. But I know that we cannot prescribe an effective cure until we understand the depths of this illness. The danger that we are facing today is the existential threat of a messianic state, a state governed by a hardline religious worldview. As Andres Pacoini wrote in a brilliant piece this past spring, as much as the Jewish historical experience should have vaccinated us against the illness of extremism, we are not genetically immune. We carry the recessive gene of extremism. Without the most dramatic intervention, I am telling you, this disease will ravage the body. Of course, when we look honestly, we see that this threat did not emerge ex nihilo. Back in the 1980s, Amos Oz, beloved Israeli writer and public intellectual, was warning that the occupation had already become a monster, one that excused and normalized sadistic acts of violence and revenge. He beseeched us then to take this threat seriously. Let us remember, he wrote, this sect of Jewish extremists received the bullets 
the rifles and the machine guns from the state of Israel, from our hands, because the state of Israel did not understand that their ultimate goal is not to mow down Arabs, but rather to eliminate the state of Israel altogether and to establish in its place the unhinged messianic kingdom of Judah. If we don't all rise up, O's warrant, hawks and doves, religious and secular, rabbis and legislators, if we don't rise up and call out sadism and pogrom, Judaism itself will be dragged to the depths of moral confusion and abject misery. But not enough people did rise up. Instead, successive administrations, both there and here, and generations of Jewish communal leaders, both here and there, whether from fear, from love, or from ignorance, turned a blind eye to the growing threat, as if ignoring the disease ever helps the patient. And today, our beloved Israel, and arguably Judaism itself, is being dragged to the depths of moral confusion and abject misery, just as Amos Oz had predicted. The hardest and worst of all, the Salonim Rebbe writes, is when one needs to remove part of his foundational nature to uproot the root of evil that dwells within. That really is the hardest and the worst of all. What are we to do when we discover through honest diagnosis that the disease has been lurking in the system for decades and has now metastasized? Henry David Thoreau, a lifelong abolitionist, wrestled with this question too. He went to Walden Pond because he desperately yearned to wash his hands of the slave state, only to realize that walking away does not stop an injustice from being perpetrated in one's name. In other words, abandoning Israel now might feel righteous, but it is not a moral choice. Walking away does not help Adele or Yuval or Anat. It doesn't actually help anyone. In fact, the suffering will likely only be prolonged and perpetuated once the people of conscience have disengaged. But if we don't walk away, so what path is left to us? There is, I am telling you, only one choice. In Thoreau's words, let your life be a counter friction to stop the machine. Let your life be a counter friction to stop the machine. Do not dismiss, disengage, downplay, disregard the life-threatening illness. Instead, we must mobilize to treat it even at great risk. The establishment of the State of Israel was the most hopeful, definitive response to the slaughter of European Jewry. The Jewish community understood, as Herzl had before them, that Jewish safety would always be provisional in the diaspora, that we who had been marginalized persecuted, even genocided, would need to defend ourselves. And out of the ashes of Europe, from the depths of our trauma, our people midwifed a new reality in the world that would serve not only as a refuge, but hold the promise for an empowered, vibrant Jewish future rooted in Jewish and democratic values. Jews in Israel did the heavy lifting and they often paid with their lives, but Jews from all around the world stepped forward. Our American Jewish communal organizations, our schools, our shuls, our grandparents dedicated money and time and resources to the project of national Jewish revival. Every room in every Hebrew school in New Jersey had its tzedakah box from the Jewish National Fund. This was the great collective project of the Jewish people. What we must do now is summon the same urgency and fervency that our grandparents mustered in their fight for Jewish liberation in order to counter Jewish extremism. Is this the biggest threat facing the world? No, it's not. But it is the greatest threat facing the state of Israel. And it is the greatest threat facing the Jewish people. I was speaking with Jamie the other day about the miracle of her survival from that tumor wrapped around her spine. And we found ourselves most grateful upon reflection, not only for the incredible doctors, but for Ellen. 
her persistent friend. Probably in my gut, I knew for years that something really wasn't right, Jamie said. But it took a friend, a real friend, to say to me, this is serious. You have to find out what's actually going on. It took that for me to take the step that ended up saving my life. We, American Jews, need to be real friends now. That doesn't mean firewalling and soft peddling and mincing words. It means speaking truthfully and publicly about the ailment that is endangering the life of this patient. We must be brave and we must be clear in our condemnation of Jewish supremacy and messianism. We need to draw red lines, say no to occupation, no to annexation, no to fascism, no to Jewish terror. And for those of you waiting to hear if I'll now say no to an apartheid state, let me be very clear. Without a strong, independent Supreme Court able to check this government as it pursues its hardline agenda, it will become increasingly difficult, if not impossible, to defend Israel from that characterization. We must fight the conditions. We must fight the conditions of apartheid with at least as much fervor as we fight the designation. Our American Jewish institutions must not offer scaffolding to the occupation or the messianic delusion. Many well-intentioned institutions and individuals on this side of the ocean are unwittingly right now funding, platforming, and supporting this extremism. These are good people. These are people who don't want to prop up an authoritative ethno-nationalist theocratic regime. They don't share that messianic supremacist ideology. But whether from love or from fear, they have failed to honestly examine the body that is on the table. And that ends now. We have to do the forensics on our tzedakah, refusing to support organizations and initiatives that strengthen the settlement enterprise. This means shifting philanthropic dollars away from institutions that are effectively sustaining an untenable status quo. We have to refuse... We have to refuse to strengthen the very extremists who are demonstrating such profound contempt for our Jewish lives and for our values. Part of what makes this so hard, I want to acknowledge, is that this is not some abstract theoretical diagnosis. It is our beloved on the table, including Israeli family and friends and our own diaspora Jewish community. But on this day of Cheshbon HaNefesh, on this day of deep, honest, self-reflection. I beg us to recognize that if we are not willing to do uncomfortable, difficult things, even as the Sloan and Marebi wrote, potentially life-threatening treatments, we are enabling the disease that is attacking this body and that we cannot abide. And then, after all of those no's, we need to step into the fray and say yes. Yes to a true democracy. Yes to shared society with equal rights and dignities for Palestinians and Israelis. Yes to a thriving, pluralistic Jewish culture. Yes to women's leadership. Yes to LGBTQ liberation. We have to answer the call of Israeli civil society, those who are in the street protesting the extremism, and those lifting up a counter vision of a true, just, democratic society. It is possible but only with our support. And we do this through supporting Israeli leaders and organizations that are on the front lines fighting for Israel's future. If you will indulge me one final metaphor, instead of us planting trees in Israel, let our generation's project be to plant democracy in Israel, supporting the New Israel Fund, whose grantees are working every single day to protect the human rights of all people living in Israel and the West Bank. Let us plant justice through our support of human rights organizations like the Association for Civil Rights in Israel and Yesh Din. Let us plant feminism, bolstering Jewish and Palestinian women's leadership through support of organizations like Women Against Violence in Nazareth and Israel Women's Network. Let us plant the seeds of shared society through our support of Omdim Biyachad Nakif Ma'an, the brave Israelis and Palestinians who are reminding us every single day that where there is struggle, there is still hope. The only force powerful enough to counter a Torah of extremism is a Torah of love. 
Let us plant a Torah of love, supporting small emuni, mobilizing left-wing observant Jews in Israel, and Sion in Jerusalem, where Rabbi Tamar Lada Appelbaum counters the annual violent rampage through the old city on Yom Yerushalayim with public multi-faith prayers for peace. The state of Israel, very simply, has been the most important project of the Jewish people in modern times. What is happening there today is very, very dangerous, but it's not yet over. Listen to Thoreau. We dare not equivocate in the face of a moral earthquake. This is the moral earthquake. My college professor, Yosef Chaim Yerushalmi, insisted that messianism is not the only possible form of human hope. So what other hope is there? There's the hope of the speakers at the parents' circle, Yom HaZikaron, Memorial Day ceremony. There is a reason that those hecklers were working so hard to silence their voices, because these speakers and their supporters, among them people in this room, have chosen not revenge, but love, not despair, but hope. They have chosen to keep their loved ones' memories and their own great dreams alive by spreading a message of honesty and accountability, peace and reconciliation. From the depth of our sorrow, one person said, we have found a deep desire to work together in order to show that there is another way. Ru'u otanu, see us, we say, ru'u otanu. See us, those of us who have paid the ultimate price, if we can say enough, then all of you can join our call. So let us join the call. It's time for us to bring the medicine of love and hope, a medicine so powerful that it counters the forces of extremism and can be harnessed not only to heal, but also to build a vibrant Jewish future and a truly just society. Gamar Khatimatova.